Stanford University. Welcome to the Stanford Seminar on People, Computers, and Design. This week and next, we have two speakers that, in different ways, have done HCI research in conjunction with the arts. Uh, next week, we have Warren Sack, who is going to talk about his work on voting. And this week, we're really fortunate to have Steve Benford. Steve is a professor at Nottingham, where over the years, he's done a number of interesting projects in the area of mixed reality and collaborative work. And one of the things that I think is particularly interesting about Steve's research is that a lot of his research projects have been in collaboration with art groups where, in essence, he serves as the helper helping them get their research done and then uses that helper role as a way of building theories in, of human-computer interaction. And it's a really creative strategy for doing research, and he's going to tell us about uh, several of the projects he's done in that vein. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for... Uh, allowing me to speak to you. And yes, perfect introduction. Um, that's essentially what I'm going to do, talk about uh, one or two projects and then also talk about some of the, the theory that comes out of it. Um, yes, I've been working with artists mostly from a theatre and performance background, um, I guess for heading on for 15 years now. And I think during that time we've probably worked, you know, six or seven different Artist groups probably created in the region of 20 projects, some of them small scale, but some of them quite big scale that have toured to kind of multiple cities uh, around the world. And yes, our role as a lab is, you know, we um, luckily we've, I think, by now got a reputation among at least certain artists that we will try and engage with them, take their ideas, make them happen, support them in touring them. But then we sort of roll in once that's up and running and do ethnographic studies. Um, here we go. Ethno-methodologically informed ethnography, it's taken me many years to, uh, to, to learn to say that, uh, where we essentially observe how they were designed, how they were experienced, how they were orchestrated and run, and we start to pull out some more general findings for HCI. And over the years, we've published a, a bunch of papers from different performances that highlight often unusual challenges for HCI. Uh, recently, made an attempt to put a lot of that together try to step back and take a bit more of an overarching view of what I think is going on with these experiences. And um, this is this notion of trajectories through the extended user experience that will be right at the core of what I want to say today. So anyway, the first thing, let's start with an example. As I said, there are a lot of examples we could draw upon. And in choosing one, I've gone back quite a long way through the history of the work we've done to 2003. That really is back in the day. Um, and I've chosen Uncle Royal around you because it has quite a complex structure, and it therefore, it, in one example, I can illustrate a number of the points that I want to make. Many of the things that I'm going to say in the talk would be found in other examples, but perhaps in a more piecemeal way. Uncle Roy's a kind of good, good overview. This was a piece of work uh, made with an artist group called Blast Theory. That's the group that we've worked with, I think, most consistently on the longest term basis. I mean, since about 1997, we started working with them. So this is a very much a mid-burn uh, blast theory project for us. Uh, I wonder, well, I'll quickly introduce the overarching concepts, and then I've got some video documentation that will probably explain it better than I can. But in essence, Uncle Roy is a sort of mixture of a theatrical performance and a game. It has elements of, of all of these things that takes place both on the streets of the city and online. You can play in two different ways. Uh, on the streets of the city, you turn up at a venue, they give you a handheld computer, they send you out into the world, and they say, you need to find Uncle Roy. You follow a series of clues, quite ambiguous ones, through the city. Uh, eventually, you're led to an office where you're asked to do various things. Could be Uncle Roy's office. From there to a phone box, and there you're asked to get into a car where various bits happen to you. As an online player, you're in some kind of parallel, virtual, slightly fantastical recreation of that part of the city which you can explore, and you can find out things that the street players don't know. In particular, you can find out where Uncle Roy's office is, and you can then start to send them messages and get messages back in an attempt to guide them to Uncle Roy's office, uh, if that's what you want to do, or to mess around with them, uh, if that's what you'd prefer to do. That's your choice, and that's the thrill for you. So look, I've got, um, got a bit of video here, somewhere, anyway. What did I do with it? I left it laying around on the desktop. Um, it's quite long, so we'll just skip through bits of it. But uh, yeah, this is some 
video documentation of Uncle Royal around you. Uncle Royal Around You is a game which sets online players alongside players on the streets of the city. Equipped with a handheld computer, street players are sent out into the city in search of Uncle Roy. Online players explore a virtual model of the same area of the city. They can follow the progress of street players and communicate with them via audio and text messages. Each street player has only 60 minutes to find Uncle Roy. Online players can uncover the location of Uncle Roy's office and so guide street players to their destination. This is a game in which you walk around the surrounding area using one of these. This map shows mm -hmm. the game area. Mm -hmm. To move around it, tap on the me icon and drag it. Mm -hmm. This is the microphone. Mm -hmm. You'll need to speak into this to record messages to online players. Mm -hmm. Your first instruction is as follows. Mm -hmm. Head for a location in the park. Uncle Roy will send you a message indicating where this is. Once you get there, tap I am here. Okay. I'm doing well. I need to wait for someone coming the opposite direction. Gently turn and follow them. Sometime later, she gets a clue to direct her towards Uncle Roy's office. This is the street player joining her, uh, the online player, sorry, joining her there. At this point, the online player gets a video surveillance view of the office available, the so the mode of interaction changes a bit. <laughs> While she's in the office, the online player gets a series of questions about, but essentially, to what extent would you trust in strangers? and would you be willing to enter a year-long contract to help a stranger if they call on you? And if you say yes, it takes your contact details. Well, after the office, she's directed to a phone box through the clues. I'd like to ask you 
a few questions. And I'd appreciate it if you would answer the questions as honestly as possible. 14. And she gets asked the same questions, trusting strangers, would you be willing to enter a year-long contract to, to help someone else? And her details are taken if she is. Um, and for those people who say yes to that question, a um, couple of weeks later they get a postcard through the post uh, with uh, another person's details written down and says, if you've got any problems in the next year, give them a call. Uh, so that's Uncle Royal around you. And um, as I say, broadly typical of a range of kind of performance, game-like, live, digital media experiences, for want of a better word, that, that we and, uh, and various artist groups made uh, over the years. Now, Uncle Roy is a son, clearly an unusual kind of experience, uh, and our ethnographic studies raised a whole bunch of interesting questions that we could publish about. Some of them were about the way that the kind of location-based technology worked and, and were quite relatively conventional HCI. Some of them were about things like um, the frame of the experience and how ambiguity comes to play in what is inside the experience and what is out. So if you've read much game theory, you probably are aware of the notion of the magic circle that people talk about, that is, you know, the, the boundary around the fiction of the game that, that allows you to understand what's real when you're, you know, and what's fictional when you're shooting people, for example. And Uncle Roy plays around with that frame in, in very interesting ways. It, it uses the ambiguity of being on the city streets uh, to create sort of excitement and tension, but at some risk. So we, we wrote about those things, and that, that's all very nice. But what I want to do here is talk a bit more about the bigger picture, what, what Uncle Roy and things like it tell us about user experience in general. I'm not going to claim that Uncle Roy is typical of anything, uh, I'm not going to claim that it's going to go mainstream in the sense that there will be things just like Uncle Roy happening in every city in the next 10 years. But I'm going to claim that where artists like Blast Theory go, they are often kind of pushing the envelope of where, to some extent, the mainstream will follow. And I've got some evidence for that in that Blast Theory have relationships with Sony and Nokia and Microsoft and other companies uh, who clearly kind of watch their work. And they clearly have some influence, including winning... Uh, uh, Game Developers Conference Maverick Award uh, a kind of few years ago. So I'm going to make the argument that, while not typical, they are pushing the boundary of the nature of experience, and it's worth reflecting on what's going on. So, firstly, I think it's quite hard to describe Uncle Royal around you in terms of kind of, if you like, some of the existing paradigms that we're very familiar with in computer science and HCI. So let's take a few. Is it virtual reality? It's got bits of it in there, is it? Augmented reality, well, not quite, but it's got bits of that. Is it mixed reality? Well, it's all of these things at once. It mashes them up. Um, is it mobile computing? Well, it's got that in there too. And you could kind of take lots of the par paradigms, and when you look at these artworks, I guess what's happening is um, what you see is that the artists are mashing them up or mixing them up. They don't really care. They, they take whatever is to hand integrate it to make some kind of bigger experience. So the first things we concluded was that um, what the artists are really doing is making extended user experiences. I know the term user experience has become, I think, unfortunately, somewhat synonymous with designing the interface on a particular device. But for me, that's not what user experience means. For me, experience is something bigger that you have, and the technology is part of it, facilitating it, but it's not the whole thing. And I think that's very clear in something like Uncle Royal around you. There is an experience of Uncle Roy that's extended, not hugely extended, extends about an hour of your life. It's not yet a lifelong experience, but it is extended beyond just a particular interaction. The structure is deeply hybrid. It contains multiple spaces, real and virtual, and complicated timescales I haven't even begun to talk about. Multiple roles, street players and online players, actors and orchestrators, spectators and bystanders in the city are all somehow brought together as part of it. And it certainly contains multiple interfaces, the mobile device, uh, the online uh, terminal and various other things. So, OK, that's not much of a, it's not much of a useful ex uh, conclusion, really, is it? Because it just says, well, these experiences are big uh, and complex. So we wanted some kind of way of describing them, um, 
that would some capture the essence of what they they are. So here's where we get into the sort of, if you like, the computer scientist training, and we start to abstract some principles. We know that those principles don't describe every nuance of the experience, but the aim is to capture and communicate to other people the essence of what's going on here. In particular, artist groups like Blast Theory have a tremendous amount of craft knowledge that they bring to bear on making things like Uncle Roy work. And that's built up over many years of um, doing these things. And it's often conveyed through a sort of apprenticeship or intern model where kind of art students come and work with them on the job and they learn these techniques and so it goes. And what I want to do here is, if you like, take some of that, distill it and push it back out to experienced designers in other areas. So that's, that's my aim. And the metaphor I'm going to work with is the notion of a trajectory, uh, a representation of a journey. And I think there's a number of reasons for this. Trajectory is a nice metaphor because it implies a sort of continuity of experience that maybe isn't kind of present in some other areas of computer science thinking. So if you think about the web, uh, for me, the kind of fundamental philosophy behind it is take a bunch of discrete stuff and try and connect it up to get an experience. The philosophy, I think, of the kind of things like Uncle Roy is aim for something that feels like a continuous journey. It's not a task. You're not trying to get to the end of it. That's not the point. Uh, the point is to enjoy or have some powerful experience on the way. Uh, so it is a journey. And it, ideally, it feels continuous. A trajectory reflects the idea of having an individual route through things. You have a trajectory and I have a trajectory. Trajectories can be steered and shaped by people. Both at the outset, you can set someone off on a trajectory, but you can also bend and distort it. And we see the artist doing a lot of real-time work in these experiences to keep people on some kind of track or to push them from one track to another. Trajectories are interwoven with one another, so to be more metaphorical, your thread and my thread and everyone else's threads cross. They interweave. Sometimes they cross, sometimes they separate. And that gives you, if you like, the social fabric of an experience. This is all very highfalutin, isn't it? But let's be clear, it's just not our idea. Trajectories are everywhere, from sociology to physics, and they're already written about quite a lot in HCI. So people who have studied uh, tangible interfaces, Eva Hornecker has written about how there is a trajectory of interaction <coughs> through the interface. It's not just about the moment of touching it. And I think the most compelling example for me is found in the work of Christian Heath, an ethnographer, King's College London, who studied museum and public space interaction. And he has some lovely examples of this. And my favourite is a video clip uh, of interaction in the Science Museum in London, where they built a lovely exhibit, spent much own money on it. And uh, the video clip shows somebody comes up to the exhibit and they inspect the bolt at the side. I don't know why. They're an engineer. They're building a shed. They need to find a bolt just that size. Whatever. They have a good look at this bolt and they walk on. The next person who comes into the frame wanders up, has a good look at the bolt, <laughs> and wanders on. And the third person who comes into the frame does the same. Why? Because your interaction with something, in the public setting at least, has this sense of a trajectory. You move into it, you engage with it, you move on. Other people observe you, and your trajectory prefigures their trajectory, and so it goes. So that idea was already out there in the literature, that we need to think about a journey through an interface, not just the moment of touching it and prodding it and pressing it. And all we've done, really, is try to push that out a bit further to think about a, a wider sense of experience. So with all of that background, let me now really break it down to the, the one true way. Uh, user experience consists of three kinds and no more of trajectories. What are they? Well, there's the canonical trajectory. This is, um, I guess if in Lucy Suchman's terms, the plan. Um, what's intended to happen by the author, designer, artist, whoever they are. The canonical trajectory is found, if you look for it, in all sorts of places. It's found in the scripts, the maps, the diagrams, the instructions, and of course the system code uh, that are pre-created beforehand. The canonical trajectory passes through something. It looks like it passes through space or maybe time on this diagram, but all I can really say is it passes through the hybrid structure of experience. It passes through everything, role changes, space changes, time changes. It's, this is a line, if you like, through this hybrid mashup of stuff. 
It's not a single line, much as my diagram suggests. In Uncle Royal Around You, it should be evident there are at least two primary canonical trajectories, street player and online player, both of which have to be designed. But actually, it's a bit more complicated than that because you get branching structures and nested structures in canonical trajectories, as you, much you do in any kind of plan. So here is um, here's a top-level view of the canonical trajectory for the street players in Uncle Royal Around You. Looks something like this. Start at the host venue. The red spot moment is your first successful interaction with the device. And that's always a critical moment for blast theory. They design that very carefully. You, you heard the instructions there. Go into the park. You'll get a message from Uncle Roy. Press I am here. If a player gets to that point, you sort of know you've got them. And if they fail to get to that point, you know you've got a deep problem. Why do you call it the red spot? Um, because an uncle, that was the artist's term. An uncle Royal around you, they represented it as a red spot on the map you had to get to, and the term stuck in their other... They would then often come back in later experiences. They talked and said, ah, the red spot moment, the, the first. This person knows what they're doing. So, yeah, it was their, their term. There are then multiple routes through the city. Now, although Blast Theory never drew a diagram like this, this is my picture, they did map out quite consciously different routes through the city. They would walk the city in each place Uncle Roy tore to several times. They would design the clue map to point people along routes. They would play a, they would work with a combination of where did they think people would naturally go and where do they want them to go and try and make the clues point that way. And the idea in Uncle Roy around you is if a player was roughly on one of these routes, they were roughly on track. And if a player was a long way off one of these routes, they were doing something different from usual. You could break down this into more specific trajectories for pretty much any part of the experience. There is a trajectory for the office, for example, a script for what's meant to happen that's carefully planned and thought out. And for any given interface, as I said before, there's a trajectory through that particular moment. So this is just the kind of top-level sense of a multi-scale picture. So I said that trajectories are... You know, ideally, they have a sense of continuity, or perhaps I should better say coherence about them. But one of the things that I think is critical in the craft knowledge of the artists is they recognise that there are certain transitions, key moments, at which continuity is at risk. The red spot moment, in fact, is a good example of that. And they have a bunch of tactics for designing these transitions. So transitions are things that you have to be particularly wary of. And if you get them wrong the experience may fall to bits. I don't have an exhaustive taxonomy of all the transitions there are, but here are some uh, beginnings. That's kind of obvious. But, you know, in the video, we saw that bit where somebody's handing over a PDA and saying how to use it. That was scripted, rehearsed, re-scripted, and re-rehearsed a couple of times. I saw it to get it just so. That's an actor who's acting the part there, however casual it might sound. So getting the beginning, framing the experience, giving a sense of what's expected, how it works. If you don't get that right, obviously, you're, you're in a lot of trouble. Anything that involves handing over an interface is always a really tricky moment. We've done quite a bit of work with wearable biosensors recently with another artist uh, on roller coaster rides and all sorts of things where he kind of he puts this kit on people and he broadcasts their data to spectators who can then tune into the rider's experience. And he has a big problem because he has to design the moment of getting the sensors on someone's body. And that's quite a long, convoluted process. But he designs that, again, in a particularly ritualized way that actually builds up the anticipation of the experience. But even just handing over a phone to someone or expecting to engage with it, that, if you don't design that moment, you're in trouble. Uncle Royal Around You is pretty much a continuous experience. Other games that we've made are more episodic. We made a, a mobile phone game, a text messaging adventure game that ran for a month of your life and that you would play very slowly, just a few messages each day. And the big problem there was how do you re-engage someone with a new episode after they, they haven't played for a bit? They've been away, they've switched off their phone for the weekend, it's their work phone, they switch it back on how do you get them back into the game in 160 characters? And how, in particular, the problem we had was you avoid the game sending them 20 messages that they've missed and completely annoying them because they get this long list of stuff that's no longer relevant. So designing the transitions back into episodes is hard. 
Anything that involves a transition into a virtual world is tricky. I don't know if any of you have ever been in a cave where someone's asked you to put one of those kind of head trackers on. And I don't know if they left the graphics on while they handed it, but that's what the engineers usually do. And the whole thing just wobbles around. And at worst, it looks amateurish. And at best, it looks amateurish. Worst, it makes you feel sick. So that transition of how you get into the world, how you bring it in and replace reality with something else, that has to be designed if you want to make a good experience. Physical things are not the same as digital things. Fundamentally, you can't make as many copies as you like. In Uncle Royal around you, there's one office and one limousine. If two players turn up at the limousine at the same time, it is a disaster for the experience. Suddenly, the fiction that this is for them is lost. All the tension is lost. They start chatting about whatever's happened or the weather or whatever, but they visibly relax. And so Blast Theory spends a lot of time in Uncle Roy making sure that two players never arrive at the car at the same time. They have to orchestrate the timing. Sometimes they slow some players down and speed others up by sending them clues and messing around so that the timing of arrival at the car is just you and you alone. Same with the office. If it was a digital resource, if it was a virtual limousine in, in some game, you could probably replicate it at will. But as a physical resource, you really can't. GPS, Wi-Fi, 3G, anything that's wireless, and lots of other things too, but particularly anything that's wireless, don't work the way that they might say on the tin. And I'm sure if you've been out there, tried to make a location-based experience, and left someone standing in the middle of a field going, uh -huh, am I connected? Can I see any satellites? You'll be aware of just how the paucity of coverage of these technologies so you have to design for the seams, as Matthew Chalmers calls them, the, the gaps in the technical infrastructure where things don't quite join up. You have to be aware from the outset that people are going to enter a moment where they are disconnected. You don't know where they are. They're not getting anything live. And you have to give them enough information on the local device that they can push through that seam and get to the next point of connectivity. In Uncle Royal around you, that's quite simple. There's a very basic clue trail on the device that's always there that will always push you on a bit. And all of the other exciting stuff, the messages from the players and all those things, they turn up when you're connected and when that's available. So there's a baseline experience that's going to work, unless there's a catastrophic failure of the device, which is still a possible seam, and then you have a different problem. And last of all, endings. We noticed that in a lot of these works, there's often a coda, something that happens after you think it's finished that just takes you back. In Uncle Royal around you, it's the postcard, two weeks later, that comes through the letterbox that just goes, ah, bingo. In Desert Rain, the first piece of work we did, you, the artist left a box of sand in your pocket of your coat while you weren't there. And you might find that five minutes later, or if you're like me, you find it two years later, uh, at the bottom of a bunch of grubby handkerchiefs and things. And um, you go, oh. Does it rain? And there's, that, these little moments seem to be quite important. So that's transitions. And we won't talk through the key transitions in Uncle Roy. There just isn't time. But here are some of them. Oh, that's the first kind of trajectory. That's the plan. Next up, the second kind, the participant trajectory. Back to Lucy Suchman. This is the situated action as opposed to the plan. This is what you do in Uncle Roy, what actually happens, your journey through the experience. And each of us, as an individual, will have our own participant trajectory that we inscribe. So in Uncle Roy, there is considerable opportunity for divergence from the, the canonical trajectory. And that is fine. That's the nature of interactivity. You can make experiences that have got very complex branching structures where people basically their only interactivity is choosing A, B, C or D. But in anything where you send them out into the city streets, into the real world, you're going to have a lot of scope for them to diverge from your plan. They can wander off in the wrong direction. They can get distracted by a coffee or whatever. Um, and so this naturally happens, and that's all right. But woe betide you if you allow divergence to happen without having something, some opposing force, that can push the participant trajectory back, either towards the canonical trajectory, that one, or towards another canonical trajectory, 
doesn't matter, but something that can get people en route. And so time and time again in these artistic works, we see a huge amount of effort in the processes and the technologies of orchestration, of steering and shaping things in real time in order to keep people on track. So, here's Uncle Royal around you. This is a bit of the canonical trajectory of the street player walking through the city, the planned route. And Blast Theory had a, a set of procedures, rather carefully defined, and technologies to try and do this steering. The first level, as you start to diverge from the one true way, uh, or one of the three true ways, the clues subtly steer you back towards the path. They point back towards where the artists want you to go. And they do it in the voice of the game, so they don't kind of break the fiction of it. They're just trying to push you. If you ignore that, the, the artists created a layer of clues. We got them to make the clues by colouring maps and writing bits of text on them, and that was then put in the system. They had an outer, two outer rings around the, the zone that basically had very explicit instructions. Uh, turn around and go back the other way. No, really, turn around and go back the other way, which is somewhat breaking the fiction of the game, but it's a harder nudge. If you ignored those, if you kept walking off in the wrong direction into central London or wherever, uh, or somewhat worse still, into West Bromwich, where the drug dealers were just a couple of blocks away, and that was much hairier, um, then they start to worry, and at that point they send an actor into the streets, they have a team of three or four, armed with a photo of you, armed with your last known location in an attempt to hunt you down. And if they get you, that actor will try and convince you to turn around sort of a bit in the voice of the game. They'll be a bit mysterious and Uncle Roy-ish. And if that doesn't work, they'll give you a good talking to and say, no, really, you've got to turn around. And that's backed up by a bunch of technologies. So in the control room are people, technicians and artists, who are trying to figure out are people on the canonical trajectory or not? That involves maps showing last known positions. Very importantly, I think more importantly than the map, the map, the map tended to be the second thing that you turn to. The first thing you turn to is the history of connectivity, which in some way I can't quite remember after 2003. This list shows you. And this is some estimate of what's this person's pattern of network connection over the game. If they are mostly green, they have been mostly connected. And therefore, you can be pretty confident that you could talk to them if you wanted to, and that they're still, their last known position is probably quite close to what's shown on the map. If there's lots of red, then you've really got a problem, because you don't know where they are, much less certainty about that, and you couldn't communicate with them to deal with it. So actually, the artists our study showed spent a lot of time on this, who's, who's not connected, and then when they thought they had a problem, they might turn to this to figure out where they might be in order to do some of that last-ditch orchestration on the streets. I said, when I mentioned trajectories, I said they can interleave. And this is a really interesting part of the design space. If you're designing one of these experiences, it's kind of quite nice to sketch out a diagram of different participants' trajectories. Here's red and blue. And to ask yourself some questions. And um, one question is, how will people encounter one another? Do I want to encourage that? And what should happen when they do? And this is the classic territory of CSCW, Computer Supported Cooperative Work. CSCW is mostly bothered about getting people to encounter one another and giving them technologies to make that productive experience. Could be same place, could be same time, different place, or any other combination, but, but that's where the discipline focuses. In the kind of experiences, these extended experiences, one of the things that struck us from the artist's craft knowledge is that they would very often quite consciously and deliberately design for isolation. Isolation is really powerful. Getting someone on their own, not talking to their friends, feeling isolated and alone, puts them in a very powerful emotional place focuses them in inwardly on their own feelings, focuses them on that device you've given them and that you're trying to communicate with them through. So in Uncle Royal around you, the fact that you start off in this kind of isolated state in the city and on your own is important. In Desert Rain, which was a virtual world game, the artists would actually nudge people's avatars apart at the start of the game if they were too close to make them confused and lost. 
before they then brought them together. So isolation is a really important aspect. And it's often the balance, the movement between encounter and isolation, encounter and isolation, that gives, gives an experience some of its kind of power. The other thing is pacing. In Uncle Royal Around You, it's remarkably difficult, once a street player and an online player have made contact, to maintain that relationship. Particularly if you've got scenes or episodic play, it's remarkably difficult for people to keep in contact in one of these extended experiences. So you have to do a lot of work to engineer that. OK. Last, the historic trajectory, the third kind of trajectory out of which things are made. So, I mean, increasingly, we like to tell other people about our experiences, don't we? That's what Facebook is all about, is constantly telling people uh, what we're doing and sharing that with family and friends and, and, and communities. In these kinds of experiences, particularly ones that do involve isolation, there seems to be a very strong need for people to want to do that. I mean, if you and I go and watch a film together, OK, I know that in our heads we may interpret the film differently, but there is quite a concrete sense of objectivity. We've kind of watched the same film, and we sort of know that. Um, but in Uncle Royal around you, you have no idea if your experience was like anyone else's. And people came back time and time again from... Lots of these things said, I need to talk to someone else. I, I need to discuss this. It was a kind of quite a compelling feeling we picked up. So a historic trajectory synthesizes a view of what happened. It is the retelling of the experience to someone else. And that's not the same thing as what happened by any means. It's very different. So to make one of these, you have to have some way of documenting the participant trajectory. It doesn't mean you have to record everything. In fact, you almost certainly can't record everything that happens. But you need to build into the experience some system logs, some photographic materials, I don't know, some, something that people can use to tell a story. You then kind of select and filter these, uh, reorder and represent them, and publish them in some other way. And you have to give people the ability to do that. Uh, that can be quite complicated. Let's take an example. Uh, think of a computer game that involves, I don't know, 20 levels where you spend several months of your life playing each level again and again and again as you progress through the game and solve the challenges in the game. It's now quite common for computer games to be able to record your interactions and you can replay that, you can see your highlights, you can even, in some games, play against yourself <coughs> from a previous version. You can race your live car against a recording of your pre-recorded car. So the idea that games can record your interactions is clear. So ask yourself a question. If I played a game like that for a month and I said to the system, show me what happened, how would it do it? And it soon becomes clear there's multiple ways of approaching that question. You could show, replay the most recent attempt at each level. That's one history of the game. Could be all right. You could show the best attempt at each level if you had a way of ascertaining what best means. That could be all right, but it might be a different set of recordings. Or if I'm telling the story to you, you might pick those bits where both you and I are present in the game and tell that because telling a story nearly always involves an audience that you're trying to tell it to. So that, that example suggests that this notion of a historic trajectory is very different from what happened. It is a conscious retelling of what happened. So to finish the talk, I'm going to go on to a second project. Um, but I'm going to focus on historic trajectories pretty much, because to be honest, they weren't, they didn't feature very strongly in Uncle Roy. It didn't make much of an attempt to let people construct a historic trajectory. And I think that's why they came back quite frustrated about this need to talk to other people. So in the last three years, we've been working uh, with amusement parks. This is Alton Towers Theme Park in the UK um, on a series of projects to design new park technology, new rides, um, but also new souvenir systems, which where this historic trajectory notion comes to the fore. So look. If you go to a theme park, telling the story of what happened is a really significant part of it. The evidence for that is plain in that it's big business. You, they will sell you souvenirs. There are on-ride photo capture systems 
that are deployed and now on ride video capture systems that are deployed that take pictures or videos of you around the park, particularly at those key moments where you're just about to drop on the ride, and they try and sell you these afterwards. So the historic trajectory in the theme park is, is definitely a commercial business. And um, we conducted an ethnographic study of visitors' photo souvenir practices in the theme park. So we, we followed various groups of visitors, families around, looked at what they did, went into their homes some weeks later and looked at which things they'd saved and asked them questions about it. And um, that study revealed some of the complexities of this notion of this historic trajectory. So let me kind of pull out a few. Um, people want to tell lots of stories in a theme park, it has to be said, but one of the common ones for the people we studied was the rite of passage. Uh, the theme park we were working in was known for its high thrill rides. It's not a Disney, it's not, it's not full of people dressed up as mice, it's, it's all about oblivion and nemesis are the names of the big rides. You get a sense of what it's about. And it's, they're family things. Families tend to go back year on year. It's quite regional. And one of the stories that comes out is the rite of passage, a child's first big ride as being a member of that family. And so documenting the rite of passage is something that they want to do. This can be quite problematic. So the top left picture is Jamie's first ride on Nemesis. And this is the automatically captured photo that they try and sell you two minutes after you get off the ride for $20. And I don't know what that photo says to you, but what it said to Jamie's parents is he was scared witless. Okay? And they wanted to buy this picture. They loved it. This is what the rite of passage is all about. It's about ragging Jamie endlessly. Jamie vetoed this, absolutely hands down. That picture was not going to be bought, and he stamped his foot enough that he got his way. Good for him, I think. I'm on his side in this. Um, his mum whinged for the rest of the day around the park about not having bought that photo, because in this system you, you buy them at the time or you never buy them. Um, when we interviewed her several weeks later, she was still talking about that photo. So I wished I'd bought that photo of Jamie that he wouldn't let me buy. Jamie rather preferred the souvenir medal, quite good for taking to school um, and showing your friends that you survived nemesis, it says. And Jamie rather liked the picture that his granddad had taken of him too, which shows him confidently at the end of the ride, having conquered the rite of passage, sort of standing with his foot on the lion's head, sort of saying, fantastic, I did it. So these things worked for Jamie, but that picture was really vital for his mum. Bottom line, not everyone wants to tell the same story. Uh, there are contested stories to be told to different audiences. Uh, the story is also richer in other ways. So we observe that people don't just talk about the rides, but they capture lots of other stuff. Jamie particularly liked bird life, for example. He spent a lot of time taking pictures of the birds. That was part of his story. So we tried to build a, a historic trajectory tool uh, that would ena enable people to tell their stories, their rites of passage stories of rides, in their own way. Uh, and that would do something a bit more, we hope, sophisticated than the, the current systems. And it looks like this. It's an app that runs on your phone, and it lets you take pictures. Fine, you can take photos through the app, so you can document your day. There are photo opportunities in the park, uh, and for some of them, this app would give you a, a location-based notification, a reminder that you could take these pictures. It would say, ah, oh, good place to take a picture. Whenever you took a picture, it was put in a shared pool with the other members of your group. Now, your group is predefined and predeclared here. It is your family or your group of friends. That's very common in the theme park. I don't want to insult anyone in the room, but if you do go to theme parks on your own, you're a bit, what should we say, unusual in that regard. That's perhaps the best phrase I can come up with for it. Most people go in groups. And so, automatically, the pictures are shared, and you would get a notification. When somebody took a photo, it would say, oh, there's a new photo in the pool. You might want to have a look. You can caption the photos. You can put speech bubbles on them, uh, any of anyone's photos, and you can put little strips at the bottom. Whenever you do this, the photo goes back in the pool, and everyone sees it again. It's sort of anonymous within the group, so it becomes quite a teasing, playful thing that you can do if you want. Um, Again, we use some location-based triggers to suggest when you might want to do this. The Luckily, in a theme park, the structure is fairly explicit, and you can spot the queue zones using GPS, and if someone's there for more than 10 minutes, you can figure they're probably queuing, because there's no other reason you'd want to be in a queue zone. 
And at that point, the system says, hey, now could be a really good moment to do a bit of that photo captioning work. Uh, so the aim was to encourage people to do this as they, at certain moments of downtime. We threw the on-ride photos into the shared pool too. So whenever you were on the ride and you got one of the auto photos taken, that appears in the same pot. So as well as annotating your own pictures, you can annotate the official pictures. And then at some point after each ride, we, you're, you're asked to build a narrative. And we went for the simplest narrative we could in the first version, the writer passage. You have to choose one picture that you think represents before, one picture that you think represents during, and one picture you think represents after. I know there are more complicated narratives in the world, but um, that's a start. And then the system automatically generates this stuff. So for each ride you've been on, it generates your own one-page photo story of your experience. It consists of the three pictures you've chosen and possibly captioned, mixed up with a bunch of stock footage, and of course it's a commercial setting, a bunch of branded material as well. Um, no mice in this case, but Sonic appears. Uh, and you get your own stories. So everyone gets their story of each ride, and these stories do vary. You might spot even on this slide the family-friendly version with the children versus the, uh, the group of mates who went uh, and had a somewhat different story that they wanted to tell. So that was interesting. That's, I introduced that because that's an example to very deliberately construct the historic trajectory, a tool that documents the experience as you go and encourages you in an interleaved way to, to tell stories. But just to finish the talk, one other thing I'll, I'll talk about as well, go back to trajectories. Um, you will find lots of canonical trajectories in the theme park as well. Each ride is a very, very well-defined canonical trajectory, pretty much linear. Once you're in the queue zone, uh, it's pretty mapped out what's going to happen to you. You queue, you go past the signs, you drop your bags off, you put on the ride, the ride starts moving, it goes through some initial cardboard cutouts and scenery, you climb up to the first drop, blah, 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 and so it goes. And then when you get off at the end, you've been through that mini trajectory. So there are lots of these well-defined mini trajectories in the park, but they are also connected up loosely into uh, other trajectories. If you talk to the park designers, they lay them out in a particular way. Uh, at Alton Towers, they put the big rides at the back of three main zones so that people, when they arrive in the morning, will fan out initially and head to the back of the park and then start to work their way around. And that's a very deliberate strategy, spatially, of laying them out. If you go to a conventional touring fairground, it's the other way around. The big rides are in the middle and there's an ecology of smaller stuff around the edge that kind of gradually drags you in. If you look at all of that, um, the blue line here shows a very abstracted view of the typical group canonical trajectory, watch out here, of a theme park that's constructed both by the park designers but also by the group themselves. People sit in the car on the way and they say, what should we do when we get through the gates? I'm going for Sonic, I'm going for Nemesis, see you at lunch. So the group trajectory of a theme park looks something like this. The group often splits and rejoins, arrive, not always. Let's go and do some separate rides. I'll take the seven-year-old to the squirrel nut ride. I'll take the 15-year-old to Nemesis. See you at lunch. And then there's a bit of replanning, and then they split and ride again. The other splitting that occurs is at the rides. Are you riding or are you spectating? So you go on the ride, you go through a trajectory. Brilliant. If you're a spectator, you hang around, you buy a hot dog, take some pictures if you can, go to the viewpoint for the ride that's been defined. Uh, try and meet up with the person at the other end in the shop, try and avoid buying them a present, uh, go for lunch. So that's the kind of the typical canonical trajectory. Let me just go back to our notifications. I kind of uh, talked a lot about how we used location-based notifications to prompt you to take pictures, to prompt you to annotate, to prompt you to select. We were quite in people's faces um, about with these notifications. You would get them all day. And what we discovered, uh, and I won't kind of run through the detail of the findings, was that unsurprisingly there are good or bad times for notifying people. Uh, so if you're doing context-based notification, sometimes it's a good thing to do, sometimes it's bad. And a dangerous generalisation, of course context is a very complex thing, 
in any given moment, there are lots of factors at play. But a generalization is you can label these canonical trajectories with some principled good or bad times to notify people. So, uh, it is the ones that work best are the queuing ones. Uh, so if you're the rider, then the first part of your ride trajectory is queuing. And although some people occasionally said it wasn't appropriate, most people said that was good. Being in the queue, getting a prod to do something, that worked pretty well. Spectators seems to be, in general, while they're hanging around waiting, it's not a bad time to get them because they're, they're waiting. Um, on the ride, you are just not allowed to get your phone out, so it's really pretty futile time to be sending anyone a notification. This one's quite bad. Whenever groups come together, you might want to notify them of stuff, but on the whole, they're quite preoccupied with other things, chatting, talking, catching up, and on the whole, buzzing them with stuff isn't that useful. Lunch, kind of ambiguous, our finding suggested. Sometimes it worked. Other times, people were too busy buying, buying food. I guess lunch is quite an unpredictably difficult context in which lots of different things are becoming interleaved. And, and so it rolls on. So, um, yeah. I think I'm pretty much out of time. So I will leave with a few questions. What have I tried to do? I've tried to talk through some of our experiences of designing this, these extended experiences. We started off with a, an odd theatrical performance. We ended up in the theme park, which I still think has got the characteristics of being a sort of a day-long, typically extended experience that you do. I've tried to suggest that um, you can at least distill some of the good practice for making these things out into this notion of trajectories. Canonical, the plan, participant, what people do, and how it bends away from and towards the canonical, and historic, I think one that's often neglected, how you give people the resources to talk about what they did afterwards. Lots and lots of open questions, some fairly obvious before you get in with them, are, um, is this just about performance and crazy art stuff, or even if it's more general, is it just about entertainment? Or are there trajectories through um, having a disease, for example? Uh, can you think of that as canonical participant and historic? I don't know. Can we extend the user experience beyond the hour or the day? What about experiences that go on for much longer, taking a degree, uh, living your life? Is it meaningful to think about those in terms of trajectories? Uh, this is always a chestnut for anyone who does HCI theory. Uh, I think they're pretty useful, I find them useful for analysing stuff. If we do a study, I've kind of got this sensitising set of concepts that I can sort of look for, uh, and it's quite interesting. Are they useful for building stuff from the ground up? That's harder to say. Uh, we're currently working in a kind of museum project uh, where we are trying to introduce trajectories from the beginning, and we'll see how it goes. So that's it. Uh, oh, last of all, the good news is there's a book. Uh, if you'd like to see a copy, I have exactly one. But if you'd like to buy a copy, I believe that Amazon have more than one, uh, and uh, that's good. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Questions, please. Apart from you, because you always ask hard ones. Well, I started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Surprise. <laughs> but I really love this work, and, and I think there's something interesting in the fact that you've been doing this for, for a long time, and there are other people in the UK who, who are doing uh, this uh, somewhat similar approach of you know going beyond traditional HCI and looking at, at things in uh, unusual corners of the real world, and seeing, of course, of, uh, Bill Gaber and also Matthew Chalmers and, uh, and others. Uh, this notion of trajectory is very compelling. At the same time, I find it a little bit um, worrisome. Uh, our lives are getting more and more scripted by those uh, orchestrated trajectories. Uh, you do the example of entertainment, uh, and, and we see it in a lot of other areas as well. So. Is, does this mean that interactive technologies, are, are, are they freeing us, or are they <laughs> uh, scripting our lives more and more? Um, so, I mean, I guess we always have, yeah, I mean, we always, always are subject to plans. Um, part of the question is who makes the plans and who defines the canonical trajectory. Now, in the BLAST theory works, they 
very, very clearly make a lot of the plan. And indeed, that's the pleasure of doing one of their works, is giving yourself up to that plan and seeing what happens. The theme park already suggests that actually I think these things are, are co-constructed. So in the theme park, some bits of the experience are very carefully designed. Other bits are suggested to you in the layout of things, but it's still the family that make the plan. Um, and I think more generally there's, a, there's a then an issue. I suppose it's about the relationships between, uh, the, my terms, are experience and the services that support that. So how much of this stuff goes into the, the design of the services? Are you trying to make one service that puts you on the rails of each experience? Or is experience still something that's constructed by the user, the canonic trajectory, by knitting together a bunch of different services? I, and that's a very waffly answer, but... Yeah. So, is it dangerous? I don't know. It depends. Not necessarily. It depends whether you want... Sometimes you want to be on rails, and you want to go where someone else takes you, either because they know best, or because that's just the pleasure of giving yourself up to it. Entertainment is one of those spaces that's very much like that. As you move out of entertainment, I think you're in a different ballpark where it'd be interesting to look at it. Um, I've been interested in, for years in uh, Gordon Bell's work in my life bits. I, I, and are you familiar with that? But no, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, let's see, Gordon Bell was the CEO of DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation, for 10, 15 years, founder of the Computer History Museum. Probably about 80 years old. Everywhere he goes, he carries a camera around on his chest, and takes a picture every 30 seconds. And I believe that what he calls his stuff, or what others call his life blog, okay. and it seems to have a, a big contact with what you're doing. And I'm just w wondering in general about your, your thoughts about um, applications of what you're doing to life blogging. Yeah. It's, I mean, you, you hit it in your final yeah. issue in that final slide. So I think, um, I think uh, yes, it definitely relates to life blogging. I think the interesting thing that, that happened in the theme park example and that should happen in the historic trajectory is, again, that that's a negotiation between the service provider and the service user. And a smart service provider will provide you with some materials in addition to the ones you make, you provide yourself. So, I mean, that's what we're trying to do with, with the theme park thing. Uh, we're having a conversation at the moment with soccer clubs about how to take the photo story thing further. And, again, the model is they will put in a certain amount of exclusive, interesting material, such as close-up shots of the goals and the action. You will then put in, of course, the stuff that's personal to you, and you can then use all of that to construct your story. So I think life, blogging your own life isn't enough, is my point. You need to have the service providers putting stuff in the mix as well. So. And there's another key difference, because you're talking about making choices along the way, mm -hmm. and choosing not to record certain so what's interesting and sort of frightening about Gordon Bell stuff is that he's recording everything. And so then he's got to look at everything. And what you're talking about is, is a selection process over time. And I mean, multiple contributors to that stream, but also a selection over time, which I would argue makes more sense. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I think you're right. And also just to highlight the, the group-oriented nature is the other thing. So. While not every experience is done by groups, quite a lot are. Uh, and again, that, that the boundaries of that sharing and that other how you document other people is really, really interesting, I think. So that's another tension in it. So please. Yeah, very interesting point of view of analysis, especially when calling out the actors involved in, in particular, particularly individuals and individuals and members of group. Another, another dimension of, of the analysis might be I think of in terms of abstraction of the notion of a a, 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 uh, a trajectory, as you're mentioning it here, two specific things going back to uh, the notion of the, the canonical path. Uh, I would imagine that's being described at a rather higher level than, than people actually experience their own. So there's, there's, there's a level issue there. Likewise, in, in the amusement park, uh, I would replace the, that one with the opportune moments for monetization Mm -hmm. the prime issue there, and where, where the, the, the higher level viewpoint is one of transaction, really, uh, rather, rather than any atomic transactions, and, and somebody's an analyzing this at, at a higher level, and, and that's the main feed into the organizational level. Um, do you have any uh, comments?
comments on sort of level of abstraction here. So um, where, where trajectory is, is, a, is a, a prime component of, of, of that. Uh, it, it definitely feels again like, the, like in spite of my claims, you know, I don't think trajectories do describe the whole world, just they give one view of it. But if you just stick with them, I think even then that they, they are <coughs> multi-scale. Uh, and, or at least you have to deal with them at multiple levels of scale. You have got the kind of the overarching design of the whole experience, but when you boil it down to any part of it, you will find in detail there are still senses of trajectories through that. You know, you take an individual ride, there's a trajectory through that. You take an individual p interaction within that, and there's, there's still a trajectory through it, as Christian Heath might have pointed out. So, yeah, you, you have to... Be able, you should be able to deal with them at multiple levels of scale, although I'm not sure that I can yet in my head, and I certainly don't have any tools or representations to make that very easy, which is a bit of a problem. Um, yeah, the second point about transactions and points of monetization is interesting. I'm um, not sure I have a very good answer. My, my co-author on the book, Gabriella uh, Giannacci, is um, from a performance study background, and she certainly talks about transactions between kind of performers and audiences at key moments. So. There is some of that stuff out there in that field that I think could be useful. Monetization was the other thing. Yeah, transactions and moments for monetization. I, I think that's really interesting to look at. Again, Fred, I don't have any answers, but the theme park stuff, the conversations we have with the people who made, who make the, the current on-ride capture systems. You know, when we sat down and talked to them at the end of it in a workshop, we, yeah, we're very much around where, where is the chance to monetize this and what are the trade-offs in making material available to people at certain points. So that feels like a rather waffly answer to your question, but uh, it's a good question. Value trade. Yeah. Yes. And it's, it's, again, it's that negotiation, a bit like with the historic trajectory there, between the people providing the service, if you like, and the people using the service. Uh, that, that's the key, I think. I, so following on Michelle's question about, as you put it, how often we want to be on rails, do you, at the beginning of the talk, it sounded like for you, choice was an important part of something qualifying as a trajectory. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about, are there th interactions that unfold over time that you wouldn't count as trajectories? And the, the simplest one I could think of would be checkout on the web. Totally boring, boring totally mundane. Right. Uh, in your view, is, is that a trajectory? Or is that goal-oriented rather than journey-oriented and therefore not a trajectory? Yeah, I think, I think there will be, if you like, goal and task-oriented experiences, other sorts of experiences that don't really have much of a sense of script or unfolding structure where, as much as I could attempt to fit them uh, to trajectories, it really wouldn't give you a lot of purchase. It wouldn't make much sense. It wouldn't tell you much about how they're designed. So yes, not everything is trajectory. And you know, you want to pick up this particular tool if it feels like you've got an experience that does have quite a strong element of scripting and structure that you want to deliver in a coherent way. And so one of the questions on the last slide is, you know, does that does that apply beyond entertainment where it's kind of very clear, you know, do you want to do bits of it in healthcare? Is checking into a hotel or taking a business trip, is it useful to design the service integration with a kind of trajectory sense so that it joins up or not? And I, I don't know. Uh, and I following on that, uh, I, I like how you talk about trajectories giving you purchase and understanding the, the interaction. Can, do you think you could use this theory to predict something about people's performance? So you talked about well, I wonder if we can use it as part of the as part of the design process, mm -hmm. as, as opposed to just the analysis process. Do you think you could use it to predict something about human behavior in these settings? I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> I haven't thought about that. Um, I mean, the artists, the artists when they're they're designing these in these quite constrained experiences, to some extent, I think, are trying to do that from their own craft knowledge. They, they have a sense of what they expect people to do, and I think they must have a reason, set of reasons for why they think people will behave that way. So I suppose in that sense, they are predictive. But I don't know whether, it'd be interesting to know whether we could get 
to systematize that, to, to whether, whether you can do that on a more automatic basis. And that's definitely, I mean, one of the big challenges of the kind of works I've described is do they, do they automate, do they scale up? How does orchestration work, for example? So, yeah, I don't know, but it's, it's a really good question. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.